Good morning, everyone. So let's, I think that we can start. Um, so thank you so much for being here. My name is Victor Rodriguez. I work for Intel. Uh, this is my 10th year at the Open Source Summit. So I, I'm very happy and proud to be here. I, it's an incredible conference. And today we're going to be talking about tool change for the future. I like this picture because it's what actually happens to me when I join the tool change community. I said, yeah, it would be super easy to contribute to the compiler, GLFC, and so on. I mean, how hard could it be to actually go and have some improvements to the tool change? Well, we'll do this not because it's easy, because we thought it would be easy at the beginning. Um, what are the tool changes? The tool chains are an amazing set of multiple projects that work together for us, the developers, to create new and better software, right? As you can imagine, we have from the source code, we have the assembly program. Of course, we need to check lexical, syntax, semantic, and so on from the compiler perspective. But in the end, we generate a set of instructions, right? And we have a linker also that goes and works with the libraries, a loader. We have the um, bin utils, we have debuggers, GDB, GLibc, GCC compiler, uh, G++ compiler. So all those tools work together to provide us a set of, as the picture, tool change to create whatever we want to create in that perspective, right? The agenda for today is we're gonna be walking about the latest changes on static analysis, security, optimization, support for new hardware instructions, and something that we want to introduce as an Intel, which is SIMIC service. Um, well, static analysis. And here I want to first thanks to the main contributor from Red Hat, David Malcolm, who's without his great and amazing work, it wouldn't be possible. One of the first thing that we have on this late, uh, this incoming GCC 14, that is gonna be released in a few days, a few weeks, it's detecting halting. So here, um, I hope that the color works. The, the halting, it's trying to do a while forever, looping just in loop loop while one. And I know it's, it's, it's a very simple code. It's a very um, not sophisticated code, but it's still a halting of, of the software perspective. So when we compile and we're here, the examples are gonna be using uh, code, um, a compiler online that we have uh, provided. Uh, I'll put you the link for, for that, um, Code Explorer. And it's amazing because you can test multiple versions of the compiler, you can see the assembly that it generates, you can see the output. So it's a, it's a great tool to actually go and test uh, latest and greatest compilers if you don't want to download the compiler, which at the end we will provide some kind of hacks of from where you can download uh, from uh, distros that you can use. Uh, but here is something important to mention. It's once we run exactly the same code through the latest strong compiler uh, that we have today in master, we can see that it's, hey, giving me a warning. Uh, the only flag that I need to use is F analyze. And the F analyze is giving back to me, hey, you're, you're, so you have a, an infinite loop here, uh, looping back to here, by the way. So those are the three outputs that we have. And it's probably a good thing to check because you are a candidate to be you having the same problem as the CWE835, right? Which is a uh, warning for analyzer infinite loop. And, and it's a great help from that perspective because at least for me as a developer, it was like, oh, wait a minute. I'm just about to commit a big mistake that could represent a big security hole. How big? Well, here is a leaf list of uh, first the description of the CWE835. Uh, which is a loop with unreachable exit condition or an infinite loop. And the product contains an iteration or, or loop uh, that even the condition cannot be reached, right? And here are some of the list of uh, CVEs that we have connected to that specific um, error through multiple projects. So it's a real thing and in, in, in open source perspective that we have uh, documentation that refers to that kind of those kind of mistakes. We have the visualization of buffer overflow. So again, it's a very simple code, don't, don't judge me. It's, it's just for, for um, example purpose, but we have here, here a buffer of size 10, and then we have a basic string copy. And the password 
uh, secure that we are passing, of course, it's out of the bones of the buffer that we have previously uh, signed. So we know as, as developers that, hey, that might be an issue. Well, now the compiler, it's also helping us with F analyzer static analysis. So uh, how can it help us? Well, when we execute uh, the code, when we uh, pass the code through the compiler and said, hey, dash F analyze, it will, it's going to tell me, hey, there is a warning. And there is a CW121, um, and it's going to give you out of the bound uh, buffer overflow from that perspective on the main function. I didn't put the rest, but here is another screen. Is now the F analyzer, thank you so much, uh, David Malcolm, for that, is not only providing me just the warning, but it's also, and, and that, that's amazing, I really love it. It's the buffer size and, and an example of how the buffer. Uh, it's it's um, has an invalid after the valid range, and how much is the overflow? In this case, an overflow of six bytes. So it's it's really really uh, helpful for for the perspective of developer, not only to see. And and by the way, it's pointing me to the line five, which is a string copy, uh, which is a vulnerable function uh, that that it's happening right now. So um, the last one. I think it's for, for the F analyzer that we're going to be showing today that it's going to be in GCC 14. Uh, it's new function attribute, which is null terminated a string arc. Uh, that new attribute, it's applied to the function with um, char, a constant char at a specific argument index, ensures passed arguments for a null terminated strings. So of course, if pointer is null pointing, the function may scan with zero byte buffer in the buffer. And the potential warnings might be including uh, warning analyzer use of uninitialized value and warning analyzer out of bounds, right? If the parameter must be a not null, it's appropriate to use both attributes, uh, the, the one that we have, null terminated string, and the attribute non-null as well in the function. So uh, this is exactly the, the from the block, uh, taken from the block from, from, from David Malcolm. And um, it has a function that we pass a char pointer and we provide the two, two attributes. The first one is the, the one that it's new, the, the, um, the terminated string uh, in this case. And, and as we can see, when, when we pass through the compiler, it's compiling for a warning analyzer out of uh, bounds. And also, it's telling me that it's, it's the specific part that it's, it's complaining and the CW that it's related to that. So it's, it's a good way to help the developers to figure out potential security issues from that perspective. Well, another feature that it's um, also reinforced in, in, in GCC 14 in incoming versions, it was a slightly change that we're going to have in the program instruction instrumentation options. And one of those is going to be the um, set uh, part of, of, of that perspective. So the GCC and it's something interesting, offers different kinds of command lines option for adding runtime instrumentation, right? And instrumentation is great because it helps for multiple purposes. Number one, profiling statistics. So we have seen things like um, profile guide optimizations to optimize code base. Example of that, auto FDO or profile guide optimization. Uh, there are multiple reference outside in the internet about how profile guide optimization help us to get by information to the compiler about what parts of the code are actually being executed more using the last branch record uh, instructions and help the, the compiler to figure it out to recompile a better binary based on the uh, instrumented uh, data that we can have from the execution. Um, another purpose of the instrumentation is to add runtime checks for detecting programs errors. For example, uh, we have invalid pointers or out of bounds erase access, or also we could have like code coverage as many useful tools for, for C GCC perspective where we can check the, the part of the code that has been tested during the execution of the validation, for example. And these checks enhance program robustness uh, to detecting errors during the runtime. So it's great. We don't just let the compiler to guess something at the compile level, but also to provide runtime information so the compiler can have a better approach on that. One of those um, problems that we are trying to solve in, in, in from the compiler perspective and also from the hardware perspective is the return-oriented programming, which exploit a stack overflows to hijack the control execution arbitrary sequence of the instruction. And it's a big deal, right? One's defense against the rope attack, it's to validate the jumps and return address that we have. 
and after, um, well, either through hardware support or software techniques. One of those hardware supports that we have is the control flow and force technology in x86 platforms. And um, of course, these options require hardware support. Clank, and this is something important, despite the fact that I'm part of the GCC community, it's something to, to, to highlight from them, which is they're doing very good. Clank also offers software implementation for uh, control flow integrity with this specific flag. I haven't tested, but but sounds amazing. Some, sounds like something that I will do after I come back home. Um, well, one of the changes that we will see in GCC 14 is FCF protection. That has multiple uh, ways to, when you enable that flag, you could pass an argument as full, branch, return, non, or check. Well. It depends, and I will not go very uh, very deeply into these parts, but it depends if you want to check, for example, the value instruction uh, to validate the control flow transfer in, in the specific branch instructions that you have, or in the return, or in return and branch, which is the one that you enable with full, and in the non as well. Well, glibc, for example, also in the latest 2.39, I think, that was the late one released in February, uh, now syncs with the kernel 6.6 .6 and shadow stack interface to enable set configure option. It's only supported in x 64 And uh, FCFC protection, it's uh, refactored in this latest compiler GCC 14 to override the FCFC protection, needs to enable equal to none and needs to be added the, with the FC protection equal to XXX. So what we're trying to do is to prevent that someone uh, disabled by, by mistake that part because security matters. In terms of optimizations, uh, let's go, let's walk uh, a little bit in this. So better memory management of applications um, and, and um, regardless of them, of some, some very interesting fact that I read in an LW, uh, LWN uh, grade paper, it's, Regardless of the amount of memory installed on your system, it's never enough. And I know that someone in the audience knows those words because it's from um, a very interesting uh, paper in LWN. So it will never be enough, right? We could have, uh, come on, we, 10 years ago, how much memory do we have? Like uh, five, four gigabytes in, in this laptop and that was okay. Today, laptops with eight gigabytes, it's like, ooh, you only have eight gigabytes. I have 16. And you brag about how much gigabytes of memory you have. I wonder in, in 10 years from now, someone will be bragging to say, yeah, I have 64 gigabytes in my RAM and, and barely runs my application, which is something interesting in the evolution of computers, but it's never enough. So one method to free additional memory that we have in the operating system, of course, it's terminate the process, <laughs> one or more that are not being uh, executed in that, in that specific time or differing approach for, from the scheduler that came up over here for, for memory management, whatever, yeah. But this method often fails short on meeting user expectation regarding uh, how fast and how, uh, how reliable do we free the memory, right? It's not something like we say, oh, I'm gonna kill this process and the memory will be free immediately. Not really. So one of the, th oh, here's some change of the slides. One of the things that we um, need to, that, that, that happen, it's that terminating a process should instantly free the memory and to other users, not true. The terminated process is responsible for its own resource cleanup and liberation, a task executed within the kernel context, right? And in this graph, we have like the memory and the time and the RAM pop down. It's not an accurate, it's just, just for, for showing purpose. But there is a time about how much time do we spend cleaning off the memory, right? So additional factors can impact the speed of the memory liberation, such as the CPU workload, uh, and, they, or, and whether if the operating is low or low power state. So there are multiple variables. GLIPC, uh, since a year ago, 2023, improved a little bit the process and release. On Linux now, the process and as we know, the process and release function has been added and, and, and for GLIPC and allows the, the caller to release the memory of a dying process. Now, the, the GLIPC will allow us to do this from a system call, system call perspective. The release of the memory is earned out in the context of the caller, using the colors of the CPU affinity and priority with the CPU use as a condition of the caller. So this is a very simple example that, that, I, that, that it's uh, taking, but 
It's how can we use the M process release? Now it's in, in Haze as a system call from the glibc perspective, which is great for us as, as developers. Now, another improvement on the performance, it's, I like this one very much, it's sometimes we put breaks inside our inner loops, right? And that loop could be candidate for vectorization. So believe it or not, if you have, if you have today, you know, if you, you have your code with a loop that could be good candidate for vectorization, but you decide to put breaks inside the loop, the compiler will not vectorize at all. And here is an example. The same piece of code. Uh, here we have the, uh, where's the pointer? Uh, here is the pointer. Here we have the source code. Here we have the master branch. As we can see over here, we have vectorized instruction using the trunk master. The, the flags used it over here was F3 vectorized and M tune equal M arch equal native, I think so. But uh, minus O3 also. The same flags were used using GCC 13.2, and as we can see, they are using basic moves, lead move, and so on. While in the other part, they are starting to use some vectorized instruction, and it's because for previous. Uh, version of the compiler, like the current one, does not detect or does, does not uh, propose to vectorize that code because of the um, injection of the breaks in the for loop. Okay? Now, um, another important thing that it's a little bit uh, helping us today as developer is the hardware capability tunables or the hardware caps in the glibc library. Well, there are very elegant solutions about where do we put the specific libraries that are compiled for some specific approaches, for, for some specific optimization, right? Um, then dynamic linker loads optimized implementation of the sure objects from the subdirectory on their glibc hardware caps. That's what it happened. If you want to release an operating system and you said, I want my operating system to be optimized for, let's say, x86 or AMD or Boat or ARM or so on. And inside these hardware vendors that are Intel x86, there are different kinds or different flavors of platforms. And each one of the platform provide a specific new instruction set that are different from uh, one to the other. Let's say, for example, uh, talking about hardware, the servers that exist 10 years ago include ABX and ABX2, which are different, uh, some specific kind of vectorization. The ones that are launched this year from Intel perspective, it's going to have something called advanced metric extension, which we will touch in a minute. But the point is, the new advanced metric ex uh, extension has a two-dimensional array that can do matrix multiplication. And of course, the speed of, of the multiplication goes way too much. I mean, the performance, it's amazing. But the problem is, how do we compile a library, an operating system that could, when we install on either one of the new platforms or on one of the old platform, both the, the same operating system works and the linker choose the right optimized uh, library. So hardware caps, uh, we worked with this with HLU from glibc years ago. Uh, we said, hey, why don't we create a capability on the linker to actually go and check the CPU ID and say, hey, in what platform am I? And based on the check of the CPU ID, decide what of the linker to the, the linker choose which specific platform, right? Um, the initial subdirectory supported long time ago was like x86, 64, b2, b3, b4. By the way, for ARM, we have exactly the same support. It's not only for x86, uh, AMD, or Intel, but it's exactly the same, right? The subdirectory names correspond to the vendor independent x86 microarchitecture, right? And now, the, we, we provide a presentation about these in, in the Open Source Summit 2017. Now, the subdirectories for glibc hardware caps in, in, in priority years was like this, version 2, version 3, version 2, and, and, and so on. Now, the new features in glibc enables library to use newer CPU features if they haven't benefited from them, right? Uh, for example, if a particular library will be substantial faster, uh, thanks to the specific feature from newer version of the proper uh, of the processor architecture, th that's when we provide that support. The developers can provide the version version of, of, of the library for libraries that use the new feature or slower than ones that has been using different old architecture, right? 
And the, part, the best part of this is that it's completely automatic. And here I have, I hope that the, well, the size definitely doesn't help, but we have a specific um, um, code. And the code, when we go and check into the object DOM, we start to see how it's calling the specific library in the specific hardware cap uh, directory, right? And it's done automatically. So you, as a developer, you don't care about if it's using the optimized version of the specific library or not, as long as your operating system vendor provide both uh, version of the library. Now, um, in this case, which is using a clear Linux operating system by Intel, we can see from when we do an object dump of that specific library that was using, the use of the specific vector instruction optimized for that specific platform. And if we run this in a very old system that does not provide support for this new instruction, we'll be ex the, the program will run straightforward very smoothly, but without any change on the uh, execution, but the library that will be compi called it's compiled for using those old instructions. Uh, GCC 13, since last year ago, has some improvements on libstdc, making it, uh, and I put the, the, the picture because it put it on diet. <laughs> so we made uh, libstdc on diet. Uh, libstdc is the standard C++ library. It's needed to compile C++ code. Um, and it's very much what you call when you include iostream. It's, it's pretty much when the, one of the basic library. And, and, and now, here, I like this picture because we have the two version, two compilers, and we can see the size reduction of that, right? One of the memory enhancement coming from this library, chipping in GCC 13, address the um, plain point of the, of the iostream header. Let, let's focus on that. So current version, like this includes iostream in a in, in a transaction in, in unit um, introduced a, a, a construct way to to have a much more heavy piece of code. The benefit of this reduced execution, of course, is the link uh, time, the proper use of memory, the start of the, the C++ process when you load that into memory, and so on. So we put it literally uh, the library on diet to make it much more slim, much more faster, much more uh, easy to, for the operating system to use. And there is a great blog and, and main of the work uh, credit to that. It's, it's Patrick Polka from, from Red Hat as well. Now, um, support for uh, new hardware instructions. Intel is going to come up with two different kind of platforms this year, Granite Rapids and Sierra Forest. And we always wonder, well, what about me? I don't, I, I, it's not, not from, for, for my interest. Uh, well, if you're developing type of, uh, type of cloud, those, these two little servers are going to be launched into the cloud system in the next incoming months. So we, as developers, in my personal opinion, will be good to have the knowledge about what is going to be included into those pieces of hardware in terms of instructions, right, about new accelerators and so on. So the next slides will try to cover that. The first one, oh, and this is an important break that I would like to, to, to explain. Uh, when I started to, pro to work in the Sierra Forest, as in the Brazilian validation and of the software for the Sierra Forest, they said, hey, Victor, this is the Sierra Forest, it's the new pet on the block, and I would like you to tell you that it's the first one without backward compatibility in terms of instructions with the previous ones. And I was like, you're crazy, right? I was like, no, uh, we will have a bunch of atom-based technologies uh, cores on top for a servers. And I was like, like micro servers? No, like atoms with asteroids. And I was like, okay, explain more to me. So look, Victor, Granite Rapids, it's gonna be the next generation after the code name. I, I, if you ask me what is the code name outside Intel, I, I, it's hard for me to, to follow up, but Granite Rapids is the next one after Sapphire Rapids, which is the latest server that was, was introduced. And that was great. So it's, it's like having a Ferrari. You have a great server with accelerators for AI, with accelerators, two, two uh, dimensions array. I'll tell you in a minute about that. And that's fantastic. How many cores? 64, something like that. Like uh, still a number of cores that we have like a bunch of power. Sierra Forest, it's different. Sierra Forest will have 144 cores uh, or even more uh, per, per uh, socket. So. Sierra Forest, point number one, will not include AVX 112. And I was like, 
Okay, that's a big deal. So if I have an application that it's optimizing for using vector instructions, uh, vectorized instruction using 512, ABX 512 ISA or uh, 512 bits registers, CDMM registers, are we going to support them? Nope. We will only have support for ABX2 and 256 bits registers. And I was like, that's the first incompatibility server that I have seen in my life. So what are we going to do? Create a huge bunch of software testing for that. Oh, okay. So there it is, me and my, and my team working for the last two years since we have the Presilicon information about checking that every piece of software that we have inside for, for that actually works without illegal instruction. And I'll ch show you the tool that we use to do that validation to share that with the rest of the community and, and they don't have to suffer the same way. Um, so let's focus on the first one. So we have the P core for performance, E cores for, for, for um, um, low power consumption, which is the Sierra Forest. And we have Intel AM, one of the new instructions that come off in the Granite Rapids, it's going to be AMX floating point 16 for the Granite Rapids server. What is this instruction? It's a, it's, it's, it's a piece of hardware. So we will be able to do matrix multiplication of floating point 16 elements from uh, TMMM registers. And I'll explain in a minute what is a TMMM register. This TMMM2 and TMMM3, it's uh, going to be the ones that are going to be the inputs and the result will be in another tile. And I, I, I think that they choose the right word to describe what is, a, what is a TMMM register. Literally, a tile. Two dimensional register, like the one that you could have in your bathroom, in your wall or so of tiles. And you can put inside the data and the matrix multiplication will, be, will happen as we did in the high school or in the university, literally. There is no, uh, how do I reaccommodate? How do I align memory? Nothing. It happens register to register, but in two dimensions. Uh, and this is a matrix multiplication using bfloat16 um, uh, precision. The Intel intrinsics uh, guide provide you when you said include intrinsics, the capability from C to actually use that one. Instead of calling assembly, you just need to say, hey, I'm going to include intrinsics, completely uh, included in GCC. When you download, you don't need to download any other package. No. Included in GCC, you just say, I want to include intrinsics.h, and I want to use that one. And you said, how do I use the tiles? Where, of course, we have, and I have presented this in previous version of, of the conference, we have... Um, instructions from the intrinsics perspective from the library or, or functions that actually load from memory to the registers, right? And then from the registers to memory, okay? What is the architecture of an AMX uh, compute port? So we could have an um, Intel architecture host, that's what this, this part is, and we have multiple tiles and accelerator commands, meaning, for example, I want to clean up my register, tile clean. I want to fulfill with zeros, tile zero. I want to do the inverse of my matrix inside the tile register. There is an, there is an instruction for that. In assembly, of course, uh, that has the representation of the intrinsics.h. How many tiles registers do we have? Well, we have eight registers of uh, tiles. What is the size of that register? It could be configured based on the rows and the, uh, and the columns and the rows, and it could fit up to 1K of data. So it's huge. You can put a uh, matrix of, of that size. And of course, the first accelerator, it's the matrix multiplication, which is TMUL, right? It's, it's the kind of instruction that you can do on two tiles once you load from memory into, um, in, into the register. And this is how it looks, the code that I created for, um, for that example. So as you can see, the tile multiplication of the bfloat16 is going to happen. Sorry, and I, uh, it's, it's a very bad example. One, two, three, it's not very um, computer stressful. This example, it's already in master trunk, by the way, for GCC. 
And as you can see, we have the ways to load from a specific uh, memory into the registers, whatever we want. And we want we can also do the, comp in this test case, we do the operation manually and then we do it with the instruction and then we compare that both actually works together, right? So it's pretty straightforward to use that if you want to use it in your library or in your projects and, and take advantage of these new uh, x86 instructions. Uh, Sierra Forest, it's going to come up with a uh, new ISA. And one of the first things that we're going to be adding is uh, for crypto. Uh, fifth, well, it, it has been introduced before, but what we want to say that it's also supported for Sierra Forest, which is packet multiple in, in sign it of 52 bits. If you ask me why 52 bits, because the algorithm for cryptography works that way. Uh, I'm not expert in cryptography, I are working compilers, but when we talk with the cryptography team, they said, oh, we need uh, this kind of instruction. Okay, perfect. And it has been introduced in previous servers. So it's available also in Sierra Force system. How does it look? Like this. And as you can see, there is a way to actually call the instruction straightforward, including the intrinsics.h library. And one of the things that it's important to include in the incoming servers, it's the AI, because as we know, AI is a, it's a thing, and multiple applications will take benefits of the AI uh, instructions. So at, at x86, we said, well, we want to add new instructions also for that. So we have ABX, which is a vector instruction, that actually perform the neural network approach, the convolutional neural approach. What does it do? It takes two inputs, do the multiplication, then add to other four uh, same operation, and then the result of that it's going to be added to another offset. Uh, pretty much what uh, we do in, in, in when we apply kernels on top of image divided into red, green, and blue, do the kernel on top of the matrix multiplication for red, green, and blue, in this case is three, and then you add another offset to the neural network um, algorithm uh, just to, to, to compensate that part. So the same thing happening one instruction, it not one cycle. It will be amazing to have one cycle for that instruction, but I will tell you the truth. It's multiple cycles instruction. Uh, I don't have the exact number of the cycle per instruction of this one, but I do have an example of that. And it's how do we load into these uh, registers? In this case, it's not anymore an AMX register because it's not supported in Sierra Forest. We only support ABX2 registers uh, or, or uh, YMM registers for, for that case, 256 bits. How do we perform the compute operation for that? And the last thing that I want to talk about in terms of Sierra Forest is uh, we will not support bfloat 16 on Sierra Forest because it takes a bit of compute part. So what we said is like, how do we do that? So we're going to introduce a new instruction, ABX and eConvert, which actually it's going to translate from a bfloat 16 into uh, floating point uh, 32. And so if you have your application and you in, in bfloat 16, uh, it doesn't matter. We have an instruction that transformed that into floating point 32, and that is easily to be processed with existing instructions that we have in the in in, in the chip. Uh, how can we develop? How developers can play with this new tool change? Well, um, many of those there are many distros available. Clear Linux, Fedora 40. I tested yesterday. It, it's amazing they have that, and you can do a simple Docker pull uh, for for that one, as long as you have the hardware right. Now we have a problem as a community. How do I get access to the hardware to test my kernel, to test my library, to test something? Introducing Semix service. Semix service provides Semix. Okay, let's first talk about what it's Semix. From the different kind of simulations that we, simulator tools that we have today in the industry, we have, for example, cycle accurate or cycle semi accurate simulators. One of those examples used it in the academia is a sniper, uh, things like that. And what they do? Well, they take the piece of software and they try to forecast the performance that it's going to happen on, on, on the incoming platform. Great. It takes way too many hours, literally. The last time that I ran something on one of those was 16 days of execution, and it's huge. Now, Simix, it's a functional simulator. It will never, ever return back to you performance forecasting. Like, hey, how it's going to be the performance of my code in incoming platform that is still not available in hardware? No, Simix is not going to answer you that question. Simix, it's a functional simulator, right? It's a functional simulator. 
The bad news, and please don't throw me tomatoes about this it, because I don't own the company, is that Simix is proprietary source code, right? What we have decided to do at my team is to provide Simix service. Under the NDA, you're able to contact us as a team and we can provide to you access to the hardware that will exist in two or three years, maybe more, right? You will have an SSH, SSH access to the system. You can, well, it can be accessed through a web UI, allowing users to request a vir uh, virtual platform instance from a menu platform configuration, multi-socker, even multi-node configuration. Simix service also provides an API. It's under construction uh, by, by my team, my friends. You can bring your own application, you can bring your own kernel, you can bring your own operating system. Yeah, we have tested uh, kernel branch master on top of Simix service, so it works. Uh, the integration uh, of the is achieved through an automated workflow that requests the Simix base BP instance. So we have a full uh, pipeline that you log in. It's literally like a like a, um, um, system as a service. You log in, you request the kind of machine. I want to ac get access to this incoming uh, platform, with this number of cores with this size of memory. We have limited many options, but we have some. And in a few minutes, you will have an SSH where you can connect and actually test your system. The BP instance, it's booted using the Linux OS disk image with a pre-configured Kubernetes uh, K8 setup. Containers images with the workload will either be captured as part of the boot disk image or downloaded into the system once the Linux OS is booted. You can bring your own Docker image and say, I want to run this application, tell me. Uh, once booted, the automated workflow access to the Linux OS running the instance through the SSH to make any workload specific configuration adjustment and execute the workload that you asked in, in a Docker image way by running the container image on the uh, Kubernetes job or as a Kubernetes job. The workload monitors the, expectation, the, the execution of the workload. Illegal instruction, hey, something happens, I compile for ARM and I'm trying to run on x86 or I'm trying to run one of the instructions that it's still not supported or my compiler generates something wrong. And the, important, during the execution of the Simix, it's used to track counts of each one of the execution instruction histogram. The histogram is saved in a CSV format and provided back to you. It will give you the X-ray of what instructions were used during the execution of your workload. What can we do with this histogram of instruct, instruction histogram? And that's part of my PhD uh, research that I'm pursuing. It's detect whether the application libraries will utilize a new ISA. That's easy. Am I seeing the instruction being executed? Yes or no. Uh, identify when doing execution, when during the execution of the new ISA will be exercised. Since we can sample over the execution of your workload, we can detect when during the execution you start to use the new instruction, which is useful. We provide that telemetry. Determine the frequency of the instruction. How many times did you touch actually that instruction? One, 10, 1 million? Is it expected to what you code when you're in your library optimize it? Compare instruction execution across by, by multiple platforms. Hey, if I execute these, my application on this server or on this other one, how does it differentiate the different kind? How does it come up with different kind of instruction? Does it execute the same amount of vector instruction or different amount of vector instruction? And characterize application based on instruction decomposition behavior. This is a picture taken from this workload characterization and essential uh, paper. And as we can see here, the authors provide multiple workloads, right? And we can see that they have different instruction breakdown, right? And, and it's important because based on that, we can later do employ, for example, artificial intelligence. Imagine that I have, of these are multiple dimensions, three, four, nine. We can reduce those dimensions with principal component analysis approach and plot that in a 2D uh, graph. And after you plot into a 2D graph, a new workload came up and you say, hey, this workload looks more like this other one because the kind of instruction that it's being executed, it's much more alike to the behavior that these other ones look. And it's a very cool use case of the AI. And you say, why do I need to characterize my workload? Because once you know that your workload is like the other ones, you can have better choice of optimizing, executing. It's better. Like, it's like having multiple dogs and you don't detect that a chihuahua is a chihuahua and you put it to run close to a husky. It's, 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 it's important. And um, we can do more things. We are employing uh, entropy, 
probabilistic instruction executed, detect which one of the instruction is the much more used during a specific amount of time. Multiple ideas are coming up and, 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 and more. Please contact us uh, for, for if you want to have access to, to CIMIX uh, service project. And conclusions, um, now that I'm out of time. Uh, use latest tool change in your project, please. Uh, use new GCC static analyzer. Provide feedback and box reports to tool change community. We will be happy to receive them. Code with them. The team is not big. This is the picture of the Qualtron 2023. And yes, we are not thousands of developers. <laughs> Trust me, we are very few ones and, and always the same. Uh, if you want to test your code in incoming um, x86 platform, l let us know. We're more than happy to share uh, the access and their NDA. And that's, that's my mail, and, and I will be more than happy to assist you with that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Questions? Yes, sir. As far as I know, because I work in servers, I'll, I'll be ignorant in that perspective. Not, not we're two separate teams. As long as I, as I know, for example, Tiger Lake, which is for clients, support the same kind of instruction or almost the same one as servers. Or always, client has less instructions than servers. And I know that the servers instruction are all ported to the intrinsics library. So if that is true, the clients will be for sure. Oh, Clank. Um, I don't know. I'm GCC team. Uh, I don't know. I, 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 I could go and check with the Clang, Clang team. But there are environments which just don't use GCC. I, I agree. I, I perfectly agree. Uh, um, the problem, I, I, I don't use Clang, and, but I can go and check with some friends from the Clang community. Sure. Yes? Thank you, thank you so much, and I can clarify that part. So the static analysis will work without matter about the hardware, right? So we check the code and we say, hey, this is a buffer overflow, this is a function null, not null pointer terminated, whatever, right? The thing that I mentioned about that is that one of the new features that are coming for, C, for and it's a small one, for, for GCC, is the lack of capability to disable that uh, control and flow or FCF uh, feature, and that is not a static analyzer. That is a feature that you enable to the code to say, I want to use FCF, branch, uh, all, or, or, or return, and that requires specific hardware support for a specific instruction. Actually, it has a shadow stack and, in the sh and a real stack. And when you execute the two of them, the shadow stack must be the same one as the real one. And if the attacker modify the real stack, the shadow stack compare, and if they fail, Boom, it, it, it's a crash, right? Set is, uh, it's very well documented also in the Linux kernel documentation about the use of that. So that one is the only one that requires hardware support for x86. Thank you. Yep, welcome. <laughs>